Hello everyone, and welcome to Let's Play Star Ruler 2, with me, the Claw. So, Star Ruler 2, it's a uh, early access game on Steam, you can get it for around about 15 quid. Um, it's very similar to games like Star Drive, so it's like a 4x real-time strategy game, but uh, also got similar elements to games like Endless Space, um, Soul of the Stars 2, Sins of the Solar Empire, Master of Orion 2, games like that, and it's sort of like a big combination of all of those games, and yeah, I thought I was LP for you guys. Uh, so a word of warning, I am pretty terrible at the game. I've only had it for a couple of days and I'm still learning how to uh, properly play it, but I'll try and explain as much as I know. It's kind of a hard game to learn because there's not too much um, literature on the subject on the internet. I mean, there's the Steam forums, uh, there's the official forums, and there's uh, a few pages mostly for the first game, which I own but have never played. Uh, so, I, I think there's a couple other LPs of this out there, but I haven't actually looked at them. I just dived into the game and started playing it myself. Um, yeah, hang on a sec, I think I saved a race from earlier. Okay, uh, I'm gonna... Pr uh, can I not alter these guys? I can. Okay, so... I th I'm getting a bit ahead of myself. I have actually tried to record this LP first time but it, it didn't work out. There are a few errors in my recording software so I had to redo it. Um, so, the interface for customizing your race. Alright, it's very similar to Endless Space except there's not as much in terms of customization at the moment but as I said it's early access, it's still in beta so I think they'll be adding more. Uh, at least I hope they will because this section is a bit it's difficult to choose from at the moment because there's not too many things that give you points, like negative traits, if you will. So it's kind of hard to choose what negatives you want. I started off, um, well, I started off with a com like, random race, really. Uh, but uh, my last game, which was doing, which I was doing pretty well in, I chose this race and I've gotten to know the game a lot better since then so I am going to change a few things I'll explain them as I go along but first of all I think I'm just gonna go straight through all of these tabs to explain pretty much which what each abilities do, do um, and things of that ilk if you're an expert at the game uh, feel free to leave comments but this video is probably not for you maybe skip ahead a couple uh, the next one is probably going to be the one that's going to have most of the building and the actual game going on. The first one's just explanation. So, bear with me for that. Okay, so those of you who, like me, are complete noobs at the game, first of all, you get a race uh, name choice and a portrait choice. Uh, these don't affect the gameplay at all, so, you know, you can choose whatever you want. I happen to like this little tentacle guy, and I've named my race for Dragocloids, like they were in Endless Space. If I use that name in my LP, I don't remember if I did, but that's what I use for my Endless Space races since then. Um, then you've got the ship set here. There are two different ship sets. I'm not entirely sure which one is my favourite. I think this one. Um, they're not entirely cosmetic. Like one of these ship sets has a battleship, which has no support capacity, and I dislike that. So I'm gonna. I think this one has support capacity, so I'm gonna go with it. If it doesn't, then that's not too much of a shame, because I'll probably, for the most part, skip out on battleships. Uh, I'm more of an economic person rather than a military person, so I'll probably be fo focusing on that area of the game. The next is the series of traits. These you choose from this tab here. I'm not going to go through these, because I'll go through them as I meet them. So on the foundation, uh, you can see you've got a bunch of uh, choices here. If you want to read what they're all about, um, like pause the video and read it. I'll try and give a oops, decent explanation. Ah, oh, crap. Foundation. Okay. Um, so fortified. Your homeworld starts with an, with a native Pekalem. Pekalem is a resource. So every planet in the game has a resource. By default, the homeworld has two. But from this, you can uh, make it choose 
make it have more. Peculum is a resource which I believe gives um, monetary pressure. I think that's what it is. Basically it helps your planet develop more economically. So that's a okay thing to pick, but over what we've got at the moment and the limited picks we have, I would not go for it. Industrious for extra labour generation, that's pretty powerful. Having a place that can produce stuff really fast is very beneficial. Uh, extra grain on your home world, that's nice, it means you can expand a little bit faster. Uh, you have to, chew, have to like find less food in general, that's pretty good. Poor start the game with 250 less base income. I'm not sure whether that means per turn or just flat out. If it's flat out, then it's worth choosing. Uh, but if it's per turn, then this is a pretty terrible thing to go with, in my opinion. So, yeah, we'll have to... Yeah, I'll try and find another thing that I picked, because... The last thing I picked is my negative. I really did not like at all. Uh, sequestered Society. You have lived a quiet life so far. I don't know, but at home up begins with all its tiles fully developed. I'm not entirely sure whether this is fully functional at the moment. It appears that you can build on any tile you wish, so maybe that just hasn't been implemented, or maybe it does something completely different that I'm not aware of, so yeah, I'm not sure about this one. Space program is basically like the amoeba affinity in endless space. It lets you see a large portion of a galaxy, not the entire galaxy in like uh, like it was in Endless Space, which was pretty overpowered, but never mind. Uh, this lets you see a reasonable distance around your section of a galaxy, and it's usually more than enough for early to... well, maybe not mid-game, but early mid-game at least. Uh, population of the home are growing twice as fast. That's fairly okay. It's not that great. I mean, population grows pretty fast anyway. It just lets you colonize a bit faster because you can uh, like send people away faster. Or rather, you can grow them faster to be sent away. So, uh, like in Sword of the Stars 2, every, every race has a unique power source. Bun me for um, FTL travel. Um, you can choose multiple. No, you can't choose multiple. Like you can choose from multiple FTL drivers. Is what I'm saying. So you can start here with fling beacons, which is my personal favourite. Um, this is kind of hard to describe, but there's a building that you can build in space, which has an area of effect that, if your ship is within it, you can send them to anywhere in the galaxy at um, FTL speed. Gates are basically portals which you can construct at worlds. Very similar to the um, what's it, the hivers in uh, Sword of the Stars. Uh, you you build a gate and then you get instant travel to any section of the galaxy. Um, there's plans so that anyone can use these gates, but at the moment only your race can. Um, that could be very fun in the future. I like can set up an entire gate network, and I can imagine lots of fun things happen with that. And also they have an added benefit of your trade ships and colonization ships will go through the gates um, instead of going at um, slower than light travel. Which is how everyone else's propulsion is for their trade and col colony ships. So, yeah, this could be very useful, although I expect building gates is really um, expensive and generally my planets don't have that great production, so I personally am not going to use this. Uh, hyperdrive, it's basically everywhere uh, your ships go from like system to system, they have FTL travel, so it's like uh, things like this, like fling beacons, if you don't choose to use the fling beacon, you travel at slow, slower than light speed. Um, hyperdrive, you always go at FTL, so it's kind of um, like just a general, okay, you're going to FTL now, just general warp drive or phase drive or however, however you want to think of it. Slipstream, it is, um, how can I describe it, y you're like, you have this ship which opens up a wormhole, you can open up a wormhole to anywhere in the entire galaxy, um, perhaps even the entire universe, I'm not sure if you can send it across galaxies, 
I have not experimented with multiple galaxies yet, because single galaxies have been a pain in the ass enough. But yeah, slipstreams, they have, like, you set up a point-to-point uh, -point instant warp system, um, as long as you have the ship to generate it, and they decay over time, so like, after three minutes you'll need to reset the slipstream if you need one. They can be very um, useful for uh, tactically, that like you can send your fleet directly to someone's home world, and then back again if you need to. Uh, similar to fling beacons, except with the fling beacons you can't send them back, which is kind of annoying. Um, but it's okay to deal with. Uh, sublight. Um, every ship shows that sublight, and I don't believe there's any way to get any of these like through research or anything, so I think permanently you're sublight, which is a huge penalty, but that's why it's worth three points. Okay, personality. So here we can see a lot of uh, negative traits, uh, and this is we'll probably choose one of these, but let's go on with the rest of the traits first. So charismatic, um, let's see, strength of will, but shield against our opponents, preposition to start, begin with three extra support. So diplomacy in this game is based on, well, starting up these propositions, and then everyone can, everyone in the entire universe can vote on these propositions as to whether or not they should be passed. Um, and how that's done is through a variety of card systems. So similar to Endless Space's combat, uh, if you want something to succeed you have to play a card. And each card has certain benefits and detriments which we'll get to when we actually start doing diplomacy. Um, having an extra three support means that it starts in your favour and people who don't want this to pass have to do a bit more work to ensure it doesn't. Uh, so that's a decent thing to have. Um, at the moment, I don't think it's worth um, using, just because there's it's so hard to get a point or two to use that it's not worth wasting it, in a way, on something that you don't really use as often. Crude, all ships cost 30% more money to construct. This I might actually end up going for, uh, because money... Uh, if you play your cards right and have a good system and everything, money is something you can come by fairly easily. Um, and yeah, hope uh, def you can design a ship that doesn't cost too much and is still just as effective as the defaults. So hopefully that won't bite me in the rear. So I'm going to pick this and take away inefficient. I'll get to ineff inefficient in a minute. Cunning. Start with an extra five random influence cards. This is pretty good. Um, it will allow you to be a bit more versatile in uh, diplomacy, so you can actually get stuff done. Uh, if you want to go a diplomatic route, then you can uh, go that way. Uh, I don't do dipl diplomacy that much, so yeah, I'm not going to choose any of these diplomatic ones. Euphoric. I have absolutely no idea what happiness does for a planet. There's an in-game Wikipedia article well, I suppose it's not really in-game, it does access the internet, but... Um, yeah, I haven't been... Uh, you can't really search it properly, so it, I don't know what happiness actually does, so if you know what that, I'd be appreciated... I'd appreciate it, rather, if you let me know in the comments. Also, as a side note on the series, sorry about the um, really low resolution of this in general. I'm having to play in a uh, 1280 by 720 uh, screen, so, yeah, sorry about that. Okay, uh, inefficient. All weapons drain free supply when firing. At first, I thought this would, um, this would be not too bad, but I've seen it in action, and holy hell, it is pretty catastrophic. Each ship has, like, a supply, um, set, but it or rather each fleet has its supply set which it distributes to all its fleets which increases effectiveness so as long as you've got um, supplies your weapons fire at full effectiveness and um, do a lot of damage however when you run out of supplies I believe that you um, lose effectiveness of your weapons and it goes down to something like 50% um, I hope I'm remembering this right, right. but basically when you ha when you're have this ability I've noticed the supply drain is just incredibly huge and it's almost impossible to go to uh, sustain your fleet in a fight. 
because if a fight goes for more than like two or three minutes long then you're out of supplies and you have to go and resupply or just slog it out at 50% less damage. So, sedentary. Uh, building construction is 30% slower, applies to civilian as well as imperial infrastructure. You know, this is probably actually better than crude. Um, I've not noticed something... Uh, about, I don't really tend to build much, and I've not noticed the speed of the construction to be that slow. Uh, that could just be me, though. Uh, I'm not going to go with this just because I've already gone with crude. You know what, in fact, I'm going to go with sedentary because I buy a lot of ships, but I don't buy or build that many buildings, so I'm going to go with sedentary instead. Uh, social paranoia. It, uh, three less support. I initially went with this, and it was okay as long as you don't do a lot of proposition starting. Um, overall, I think I'd go with like one of these two, or maybe this one at a stretch, uh, if you are looking to take a penalty. Generally, the only problems you have with starting with less support are when you really need something done. For example, if you want to um, annex a planet or uh, protect one of your planets from invasion and people don't want that to happen, or you want to start an investigation on someone, um, it's a lot harder to do when you have when you start at a minus three. Sometimes it can be um, counteracted, but I've not managed to do that and well, I might need to use diplomacy in this game, and we'll just see how it goes. War-minded. Uh, basically, support and vote cards have one extra influence to, play, to pay influence to pay to play them. So, the way this works is that in the game you earn influence points over time, and whenever you to buy cards to use in diplomacy, it costs influence, and some of these cards cost influence to play. If you were to take War-Minded, every single card would cost one influence to play, which is okay to a certain extent. If you've got a lot of influence, that's great. But if you're uh, not investing in influence too much or have no influence resources around you, it does mean that you probably won't be able to play a single card for a very long time. And that could be quite catastrophic if people decide to um, start a... Uh, preposition to investigate you, which gives everyone in the galaxy sight uh, around your planets and uh, I believe ships as well. So, yeah, I, I don't particularly want to take this. However, that said, if you are warm minded, then it would actually be a decent idea to take this because then you could get something from a military tab or something even better from somewhere else. Okay, government. This basically. Um, chooses what you will start with uh, in terms of cards. So the default is Empire, which you start with 10 negotiates and 1 Annex Planet. I think my favourite is Capitalism. Um, I don't know, Theocracy is kind of good as well. Uh, it, it's really hard to tell because I, I haven't used this too much, this system. I'm going to stick with capitalism. Uh, the leverage cards are kind of uh, useful when... Uh, bec because for random leverage, like you get it chooses a random empire and then you have leverage on that empire which you can use in a vote and it sways your side. Um, so that's pretty good. Bribe is also decent because if you don't have influence but have money, uh, that's a way to actually participate in voting. Um, and a RAND card, random's always good. Uh, I would have liked to negotiate, but they're usually fairly cheap, so... Yeah, I'm just going to stick out with capitalism. Hopefully it'll make sense in the future. If there's any um, known best, or if you have any ideas about the rest of these empires, don't hesitate to leave a comment. And let's move on to the military tab. So, Ancient Vessel. I have not actually, actually before I start this, I have not actually played any of these cards, um, mostly because they cost points and I really don't want to take any more points than I have to, uh, so I don't speak on experience with these values, I'm just going to read them and 
state whether they'll be good or bad. Okay, a Renwick flagship, that would be uh, fairly decent at the beginning of the game. It means you have some military and can defend yourself. The AI does like to declare war liberally. Um, uh, it will also help you defend against, or rather, attack systems that have pirates in them. So, that could be a decent choice. Okay. Manifest Destiny, less supply is kind of nice when you're performing siege on an enemy world. However, usually when you're sieging, you're going with overwhelming force and thus have lots of supply, so I don't think it will be too useful. I mean, 25 less supply is not that much. So, I, I would forego this, to be honest. Military Industrial Complex. This actually sounds very, very nice. Um, it will basically give you a uh, when you start the game, defended gravity well, which is pretty nice. Um, again, the empire, I mean, the AI empires do declare war a lot, but they generally don't attack your home system because usually you've got plenty of systems around you which are easier to pick off. Um, and granted, you can move around with support ships, so maybe it's worth it. Um, it's probably a pretty good investment, but I'm not going to. Do we set investment yet? Okay, Pyromania. Oh, missile based weapons do 25% more damage. That, and that could be good. However, the downside is damage from fires, abo fires aboard your ship is doubled. Um, I've not noticed fire. I've uh, been in quite a lot of combat, but I haven't really focused too much on it. Perhaps this is something they've yet to be implemented. Maybe it's just something I've completely ignored. Um, again, 25% more damage is tempting, but I don't know whether damage from fires is significant enough to um, warrant being taken. Uh, so yeah, that, that's my personal opinion on this. Again, take it with a pinch of salt because I'm not the greatest at the game. Uh, but this is how I'm going to work it. Let's save that as my, my race. Okay, accept. Alright, so what I'm going to do now is I am going to pause the recording and I'll get the rest of this set up and I'll be right back. Okay, we're back. Uh, so, all I've done here is set the difficulty to easy because, yes, I am still a noob. Um, and I've also I've reduced the number of AIs by one because I think five in one galaxy should be enough. Uh, in my previous game I had about seven over two galaxies and I haven't managed to... I haven't got that far into the game, I'm still fighting with a guy next to me, but... Yeah, anyway, uh, five people in one galaxy should be a enough. I've renamed them uh, to something a bit more colourful than just Empire 2, 3, 4 and 5. Um, hopefully they'll add a random name feature, or give these guys proper names in the future. If not, then, well, I suppose I can just keep randomly making some names up for them. Um, also, I'm going to change my icon here to something a bit more. There we go. Uh, yeah, so this is pretty much the scenario. Um, I'm going to play it on a Spiral Galaxy because, well, that's all we've added at the moment. Uh, 60 systems by default and I'm going to keep it at that. Um, I've not noticed what the difference between flattened and non-flattened is, so if you know I'd appreciate it in the comments. Maybe it's, again, something they haven't implemented quite yet. And, as you can see, very sparse game settings, and I think I will keep the AI enabled, considering that's what I'm playing with. Okay, so, the game started, and immediately I'm going to pause it. Um, I recommend you do this, even if you're not doing an LP, and thus explaining to everyone what's going on. This is because it's useful if you zoom out to see what your galaxy is like, and, well, it seems like our um, bonus early on has not paid off as well as I had hoped it would. Uh, we can only see a few of the systems nearby. Usually there's like a cluster uh, in the middle. Like you're, you're usually somewhere here and you can see a bunch of systems around but well, we'll work with what we've got. And at least it kind of defines my border. So like it's unlikely people are going to try and get to here. Um, although they still definitely could because they, they can travel in any direction. Uh, but first of all let's just analyse our home system. 
So the home system, as far as I can tell, um, always has your home world with food and water on it, a system with water on it, a system with food on it, and a system with a level 1 um, technology on it. Basically how this game works is that every single planet has a resource on it, and only one. Um, it's called the native resource. For example, over here we've got water and fish and explosives. Over here we've got like phasite, meat and chemicals. So like, all of these systems have completely random things. And they are needed for different levels of planets. So if we click on our planet screen here, and click off it for some reason, you'll see that um, Vic 1, our homeworld, is starting at level 1. And you, uh, this basically means uh, that it's enough to support itself. Uh, there's four different type. well, five... There's a bunch of levels of... Uh, I can't, zero, one, two, three, four, five levels of planet. I should be able to do that in my head. I apologise. Um, there's level 0 through to level 4. Level 0 uh, is a detriment to the Empire and costs 100k a turn to support. Um, and it only has its native resource on it and has nothing else. You can see down here that um, it gives you a required and a food resource and a level 1 resource required. Basically, this is what's required to get to level 2. How do you get to level 1 in the first place, you ask? Well, you need a food source and water. If the planet has neither of these things, they can still function, but all they can really do is export what they've got on there already. Assuming that um, they are able to harvest it. To get a level 1 resource, you need to have a planet that's at level 1 on a level 1 resource planet. This might sound very confusing, because I personally don't think I've explained it very well. Uh, but hopefully it will become clear in the future. I.e. right now. So, first things first, I'm going to take a little look around at my local neighbourhood, and see what I've got. So I've already seen the chemicals here, and the meat, and the phasite. Um, each resource has a, like, a unique bonus to it, phasite here. Adds one research production for per 5 billion population. So that's pretty good, like if you have this on a high level planet, um, or even not very high level planet, if we put this, if we exported this to the home world for example, uh, and then got the home world to level 2, then it would have a, um, probably around about level 9 or 10 billion people on it. So, uh, yeah, that, that would get us a couple research points. And uh, I'll explain research in a later episode, this one's getting a bit long, so I think I'll just uh, finish up by, as I said, look around up neighbourhood to see what we've got. Uh, chemicals, these uh, just pr provide pressure on a planet. Um, the pressure system, again, I'll explain in the next episode. Uh, supercarbons, textiles, meat, rare materials, supercarbons. Basically what I'm looking for right now is to make sure we've got plenty of level 2 and level 3 resources. Uh, we don't have any level 3 resources, um, only level 2s and 1s it seems. Maybe some of these planets around here will have some. At least that's the hope. Uh, so yeah, the level of the resource is denoted by the Roman numeral next to it. Uh, okay, so we've got a bunch of level 1 resources and a bunch of food and a bunch of... Actually, we don't have too much water. Uh, that could be a problem. Uh, let's just hope it isn't. Um, I'll explain a bit more, as I said, in the next episode. Uh, thanks for watching. If you have any comments, let me know. Uh, suggestions and tips would be appreciated. Uh, if you like the video, leave a like. It really helps uh, my channel and everything. So, yeah. For the second time, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.